Welcome to Oil Painting Question and Answers, episode number seven. Um, if you have any questions for me, leave them in the comment section of this video and I'll get to as many of those questions as I can in next week's episode. Uh, before I get into the questions, I want to teach a little lesson on something that I call learning to paint ugly. And this is, um, I think that if you can grasp this one concept and, this, and, and understand what I'm about to teach you in this lesson, it's probably one of the biggest hurdles that I see that artists have to overcome. And it's something that I'm get, I've been getting a lot of questions that relate to this subject. But, but what I mean is, and I touched on this uh, when I talked about the, the four qualities or however many it was of great realism, um, but this is the, maybe the one that's the hardest to understand. So let's go back in history a little bit and look at, at some early art. And this is uh, a painting by Hans Holbein the Younger. And if you take a look at this painting, and this was sort of uh, the supreme realism of its day. It was, this was the style of painting that was, you know, the, 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 the most realistic, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, for, for the artwork that had been uh, painted up to that time. Uh, but if you look in here real detailed, and let's take a look at the eye, you'll notice that he's painted all the eyelashes. And he's really attempted to paint everything that he sees down to the finest detail. Now let's look at the fingers here. If you look at the, the, the fingernail, every little line, every little wrinkle, every little shine, every little you know, uh, um, bit of detail has been painted in there. Uh, if you look at the left edge of the collar here, you can see that he's almost gone down to the, the very uh, smallest thread. If you look at the hair, you can see almost individual hair, hair in there. And yet, if you look at this painting, um, it is actually the realism that you see here, in my opinion, is not at the level that you would see in a painting that came after that. And this is a painting by Diego Vela uh, Velazquez, one of my favorite artists. And this is a painting that he did. Um, and if you get in here close and look at the nose and the mouth, you'll see that it's really not, uh, there's not a lot of detail there. It's just smudges of color, and if you look close enough at the tip of the nose, it almost, it really doesn't even look like a nose. And so we're starting to get to understand what I mean by painting ugly. And if, let's, let's go a little much further into the future and look at Repin, great, the great Russian artist. And if you look at the eyes, let's take a look at his left eye or the eye on the right side of the face in shadow. It's not even there. If you look at the way the beard was painted and you look at it up real close, you don't see hair, you just see smudges of paint. If you look at the trees in the background, there are no leaves, it's just jumbles of color. So what you're looking at, in a sense, is you, if you go in, zoom in tight and you look for individual leaves, you don't find them. If you look for an eye or eyelashes, you don't see them. And so let's go a little further here. This is by Klemp, one of his early portraits. And if you look at, uh, get in real close and look at the skin or the hair, none of it looks like what it is. The skin does not look like skin. The hair does not look like hair. Uh, one eye is just a smudge of color. There's no uh, detail at all. And then now let's look at this painting by uh, John Singer Sargent and let's zoom way in on the silverware and notice that there's just nothing there. It's just smudges of color. Now, let's stay here and look at this picture of the, zoom, of the silverware. And I want you to put yourself in the position of the artist. And imagine that you're sitting with this on your canvas and you've just painted some silverware uh, on the table and you're trying to decide whether it needs to be adjusted or whether it needs to be changed. And if you look at the, the, the cup on the right or the goblet on the right here, it doesn't even look like, a, like silver. It just looks like smudges of color. It's lopsided, it's crooked, and yet when you back up and look at it as a whole, it all works. And so the point I'm trying to make in this lesson and what I want you to understand is that in order to paint like these great artists, 
If you don't want to go in and paint every little, you know, eyelash and detail, but you want to paint like John Singer Sargent and Reppin and these other guys, you have to paint ugly. You have to leave things alone and learn to leave whatever it is you're working on as a jumble of color that you're never going to enjoy when you're looking at it up close. So if you paint leaves uh, of some trees, um, you're going to have to learn to leave it as a jumbled mess that looks nothing like leaves. Look at this painting by Degas. Let's look at the pool table. Beautiful painting, and yet when you get in there close, the, the pool balls are, are lopsided, they're crooked, the table uh, you know, doesn't even have a, a border uh, where the felt m hits the rail. It's just, there's so little detail in there. But what he does have right are all his values are right, everything's in place, and that's all, that, that's, all that's needed. Look at this painting by Arthur Streeton. It's a beautiful landscape. When you get in close and look at the rocks, there's just nothing there. It's just ugly painting, so to speak. Now, of course, I don't think it's ugly, but what I mean is, is that when you're in there close and you're staring at it, and this is right in front of your face, it's really, really hard to leave jumbled, ugly, and I say ugly, brush strokes all in a mess when you, when you, what you really you know, you are tempted to do is to go in and over define it and to fix it and to make it all polished and perfect so that it looks good to your eye from, from a foot away or a foot and a half away. And the only way to really appreciate good brushwork is from a, a room's length where you have to get back. So it means getting out of your chair and really being careful when you start to lay in your values. As soon as you get your values in, leave them alone, step back and look at them because uh, that's the secret of learning to paint like these guys is learning how to leave things alone and move on and not overwork. Let's look at this Russian artist, Abram Arkhipov. It's a beautiful, beautiful painting here. And now let's look in at, at, at the hand. There is no hand, it's just a smudge of color. The items on the bench next to him are just smudges of color. And then this one last one of these boats. Again, if we look in close, it's just a jumble of brushwork, and yet all the values are right and everything's in place. So I hope that lesson is helpful um, and uh, that you can learn to paint by judging your work from a room's room away. It means getting up out of your chair and stepping back often while you're working, but up close, you can expect that if you're painting beautiful paintings like Sargent, your work's going to look like ugly up close. It's not going to look pretty like the object that, you, that you're painting. Um, so that's it for today's lesson, and now let's get into some questions. Can the Geneva palette be used to mix very dark black skin? And can you upload more of your paintings online? You can absolutely paint dark skin tones. This is a painting that my wife painted of uh, somebody in Uganda when she was over there, and this was all painted with Geneva paints. And let me just make it really clear, there are no colors that you can't mix with a limited palette, except for those super vivid, bright colors like vivid purple, you know, super bright, you know, intense orange that's just off the charts. But because no skin tones of any race are vivid, bright colors, you can absolutely mix every single skin tone in the world with a limited palette. And I, and I, don't, I mean every color and dead on perfect. There are no hidden colors that you can't mix. Again, unless it's a super bright, vivid color. And in those very rare cases that you need those colors, uh, you, you would have to go get a special bright violet or purple or whatever that you couldn't mix. But other than that, you can mix any color in the world. And just to give you an idea, when I, when I painted portraits, it was only one in, I don't know, one in 12 paintings, one in 20 paintings. It was just very rare that I would have to go and get a special color uh, to, to, and it was never for skin tone. It was always because, uh, you know, uh, some lady would wear a bright turquoise dress and I would have to go get a special blue-green to get that color. But other than that, I always used a limited palette and it didn't matter whether I was painting, uh, you know, what race I was painting. It didn't matter. Now, as far as uh, my paintings, uh, showing you more of my paintings, um, I just need to get good images of my portraits. 
my portrait career was all before the internet and before the, I mean, I really painted, well, not completely before the internet, but, but uh, digital photography and everything. And so I have a lot of really poor photographs of my old work. Um, and I need to update that and go and, you know, get digital uh, copies that are much better of my paintings and then I can show them to you. But I don't know when that's going to happen. You suggest preparing a canvas with fast drying white and burn umber. But a lot of artists simply stain their canvases with a fast drying turpentine wash with various colors added. In this case, burn umber. Is this an acceptable practice or are there drawbacks to this faster approach? Uh, certainly you can do it that way. In fact, when I first started, I used to do a burn number wash because I had read somewhere that, about somebody doing that. Um, and the reason that I uh, switched to just painting it on is I actually thought that was faster because, you know, when you're doing the burn number wash, you know, you can quickly do it and put it on there, but you get, you know, streaks and lines. And so if you're doing a portrait or, or you're going to be doing some penciling on it and you want a more even, consistent surface, uh, then you do it the way that I teach in my staining canvas video, uh, which is a free video on drawmixpaint.com if you haven't seen it. So, um, but as far as doing it the, the stain way, you can certainly do that, and, um, and that should work just fine. Is there any significance to the position of the white and brown on your color wheel? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, there is. Uh, burn number is right in that spot where I think it's, it's basically burn number is a reddish orangish color. And I've put it on the color wheel right where I think it, where it belongs in terms of red and yellow. So in other words, if you're asking yourself a question about a color and you feel like it needs to be more red orange, then you can use burn number just as well as you can use red and yellow. Uh, the only difference is that burn number is not as pure, pure of a color as, as, you know, an orange you could make, obviously, with red and yellow, but it acts the same in general, and in fact, I usually use burn number as my sort of reddish orange when I think a color needs reddish orange, especially if it's a dark color. If it's a dark color, you absolutely are going to use burn number instead of red and yellow because it'll bring the value down and it's good for mixing those really dark colors. Like especially if like you're making a, bra a brassy color or brass in shadow, it's burn number with just a teeny bit of yellow in it. So that's why the burn number is where it is. The white, on the other hand, is uh, on the other side because it tends to bring out purples and blues. And so if you feel like you need to lighten up a color, but you also want to make it more blue or more purple, you're going you're to definitely use white instead of yellow because it's on the opposite side of the color wheel. So uh, that's why uh, the white and the brown are where they are. What do you think of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings? Um, I absolutely love Leonardo da Vinci's work. Um, I think he's one of the you know, absolute masters. Um, but this is a good, this brings me to a point of, you know, there's, if you look through history, there's all kinds of things going on. For one, there's new, new techniques that were coming forward. And, you know, when, when da Vinci painted, uh, there, there was nobody doing a la prima painting, uh, wet and wet. You know, just paint your painting all wet in wet paint into wet painting and then you're finished. You know, sitting down in one sitting and painting a, a, a portrait in one go with all wet paint. That was not even practiced when Leonardo uh, was alive. And so I think that, um, you know, it's very, uh, if you look at the history of it and everything else, it's very interesting. I find it fascinating how he painted and painted in so many layers. And I think, uh, you know, Mona Lisa was painted possibly over years. So it's a completely different thing, and there's nothing wrong with, with painting in that style. But um, just from my point of view, if, when I look at the history of painting realism, the abs this is just my own personal opinion, but I think the absolute supreme is the wet and wet uh, method. Uh, that sergeant practice, that, that you know, Velasquez was the, was the first, um, probably the first artist that really did it well. Um, and I think he was the master, and I think that that's just a technique that I know about, that I love, that I, I feel like it's, you know, it's limitless. You can do anything with wet and wet, and I think a lot of the early guys in Leonardo da Vinci's era and before that, you know, they looked at, if, if you were to suggest that you paint wet and wet, they would say that you, that 
it would be impossible or that it would be very, very difficult to, to finish a painting all with wet paint. But then artists came, Art Velasquez came and proved that that was something that you could do. And, um, you know, there's just a depth and a life to, to paintings like, you know, that, that are painted wet and wet that I think, you know, if you look at, you know, a, as much of a master that da Vinci was, if you really look at his work, it doesn't have that super realistic quality that I think Sargent had. There's something about it, you know, where you can see every little line and the line, the detail is a little overdone. But uh, these are things that, you know, for the, for the critics to decide. Um, as far as teaching and the way that I teach to paint, I love the wet and wet method. I think it's, it has the greatest potential and the greatest possibilities of any method. And so it's just what I love personally. But there's certainly, you know, hundreds and if not thousands of ways to paint. And there's all these different techniques and some have their benefits and some, you know, are, are, are more difficult, some are more easy but it's really a matter of personal preference and I just really, really like the wet and wet method. Have you ever had an instance where you painted wet over dry, where it was not possible, practical, or simple enough to paint wet on wet? Uh, absolutely, I, I did it. It's, it wasn't very common that I had to do this, but if, you know, in certain things, like if I'm gonna paint a white basket you know, on a dark background where you have white lines and black little, you know, squares in, in the middle of the white lines. But anytime you have a real s strong pattern where it's very high contrast, like white and black or, or you know, anything where there's a, a lot of contrast, then it becomes really difficult to do all that wet and wet. So what I would typically do, like if I was going to paint a basket, for instance, is I would paint it black and then I would use the shadow color on the white to paint the lines and then I would let that dry hard to the touch and oil it out and I've got a video about how to oil out and that gets that's so that because as paint dries it becomes flat and matte and it's hard to see so you oil it out to bring back the color and then uh, after, uh, then I would paint a second coat of the of the brighter white on top of what I've already painted so I just build it in layers like that and I'll do it I need to do a demonstration on that uh, uh, soon, but basically, you know, you can use Geneva paint to build it in layers, but you just need to wait until the paint's dry, and that takes about a week or more. I'm almost out of the four colors that I use based on your palette and medium formula and wish to purchase the Geneva paint you now offer. My painting method is such that I do not want to have to wait days for the paint to dry. You add oil of cloves to your painting medium to slow the drying time. Will you offer the option for purchasing the Geneva colors without the oil of cloves being added? Uh, not for the foreseeable future. Um, really, you know, if, if you take, uh, let's just take titanium white. If you don't put any dryers in it at all and you make it with refined linseed oil, it takes about seven days to dry. Um, and so the burn number, you know, without if you just made it with refined linseed oil, it would dry in just a matter of hours, like eight hours. So there's a radical difference in the drying rates of various pigments. And what we tried to do uh, with Geneva is to make all the paint dry roughly in the, about the same time so that it all dries the same rate on your canvas. And that makes it a lot nicer. Um, but we don't put any dryers in the paint just because it hurts the long-term uh, strength of the paint film. And if you are trying to get your paint to dry fast, then probably the Geneva paint is not the, what you would want to use. I mean, you can certainly uh, add dryers to it, and it will speed up the drying time. But just in general, uh, the Geneva paint is designed for people that like to mix their color and work wet and wet and have their cut color stay workable for days, even up to seven days on the canvas and even longer in, in piles on your palette so that if you pre-mix your paint, your color's still good and you can still use it. So if you, if you are, have a working method where you like your paint to dry overnight or in a couple days, then um, you know, you're gonna have to put a lot of dryer into the Geneva paint, which you can do, but you may wanna just use a different brand of paint that's really designed to dry fast. You teach using a limited palette to create an extensive palette of color groups. This, in my opinion, could cause two problems. First, a starved palette where you don't have enough of a specifically mixed color to cover the canvas adequately, forcing you to stop painting to mix the color again. 
And secondly, excessive leftovers so that you're left with a lot of mixed paint that is no longer needed. So there's wasted effort and wasted paint. What are your thoughts about these issues? Um, that's a good question. Um, basically, uh, you know, first of all, you, I don't know of any artist that doesn't waste paint. You always are going to mix a little extra. You're always, you know, if you try to mix just the right amount of paint for what you need, you end up skimping and you end up trying to paint the canvas with a super thin layer and you don't have enough paint in your brush and colors get dirtier much easier. So you've got to have enough paint, in my opinion, on your palette to really get your brush wet and dip it in there and work it and clean it in some paint and everything else. Pre-mixing those color groups is really, the biggest part of that is that it teaches you to mix colors and it teaches you to paint. It's almost like making the most perfect color chart you could for whatever subject you're painting. But as far as wasting paint and having extra colors, you know, the big thing on working with a limited palette is if you don't have a lot of experience, experience with it, it does seem like a lot of work because when you're first getting started and you're, you know, doing the six questions and you're doing that real simple color mixing, you know, there's a lot of confusion and you're learning. But once you've done it, and I mean painted two or three paintings with the limited palette, it gets to the point, and I've, you can talk to students that have done this for a long time, you know, my wife, uh, people who, um, who I've taught, well, you know, they, they learn to mix colors, and it's actually very easy. So that if you tell me, for instance, um, you know, if I, if I run out of a color, it literally is going to take me a minute or a minute and a half to just remix that color. Um, so it's a matter of developing those skills so that you have a real mastery of your color so that you can mix a palette of color, and if you're running low on one color, you can just quickly mix another one, and it's right there. And the other thing is, is that colors don't have to be so specific. You know, um, you don't have to, and this is something I get into when I teach, when I have my workshops, is people get so crazy about getting the colors perfect, and they don't have to be perfect. You know, you can miss one color slightly purple and mix another one slightly yellow and, you know, be a little zigzag and not have your colors be so perfect. But if you're checking your colors, you're, you're going to be in the ballpark and you're going to have your values right. You're not going to be just all over the place if, if you're not checking colors. So it's really, a, first and foremost, it's an exercise by mixing those color groups. It teaches you to paint. And it also takes a lot of the load off of, of you know, if, if you think that, you know, you run out of one color, say, and you say, well, I've got to remix that one color in, in this string of colors. But if you're just you know, mixing colors as you go, well, then you always have that trouble. And to think that you can go out and buy a tube of paint, like say, and, and I want to do a demonstration on this um, perhaps in the next episode, but colors are arbitrary. You know, just because you go out and you buy a tube of, say, you know, raw umber or, or yellow ochre, there's nothing special about that tube. I mean, I can just take, let's take yellow ochre, for instance, which is a premixed color. Uh, I can just mix some yellow and some blue and yellow and mix up a new color that's not quite exactly yellow ochre but something slightly more yellow or more orange or, or less orange or more dirty or whatever it is and those colors are just as wonderful as that store-bought yellow ochre so there's nothing it's not as if these store-bought colors save you time in the sense that because they're they're specific they're going to have to be altered anyway i mean the odds that you go out and buy a green that's just a perfect forest green for this particular landscape that you're doing is very small i mean you'd still have to alter it so you might as well learn to mix colors grab some blue grab some yellow mix an arbitrary green and then say oh, that and then judge it and say oh i want to make that a little more dirty add a little red to it and boom you've got a new wonderful beautiful color that to me is just as valuable to an artist as some tube that you would buy pre-mixed in the store. But the main thing is about this method is it's a matter of learning to mix colors, learning to master colors, and using a simple palette, five color palette, is really gets to the heart of that. Because if I, for instance, look at a color and I decide, oh, this color needs to be more yellow, well, if I add pure yellow to it, I'm doing exactly what I need to do to that color and nothing else. But if you put yellow ochre in a color that needs yellow, well, you're also putting a little bit of blue and a little bit of, uh, of red because it's a, it's a dirty yellow, so it has to have those colors in there. So it's really a very direct and straightforward way of mixing colors and matching colors, and it absolutely works. 
Um, you're always going to get a little wasted paint, and there's nothing you can do about that. I don't know of any artist in the world that ends up with a perfectly empty palette when you're finished. That's just part of the painting process. But uh, in general, um, you know, you can mix small piles, and then you have to mix a little more as you go. But you shouldn't be afraid of color mixing. It's something that every artist uh, with a little bit of time and practice working with a limited palette can learn to do in, in just, you know, one or two paintings. I have been painting with Winsor Newton water mixable oil colors and washed my brushes with soap and water. I would like to switch to Geneva paints. Would I have to buy all new brushes? What would you use to clean the brushes when you, when you use Geneva paint? Um, you, you know, Geneva paint is, should be treated just like any oil paint, um, not like water mixable oil paint, but you can certainly clean your brushes with soap and water. Um, you know, just like a simple uh, dishwashing liquid uh, with some water. The thing is, is that once you do that, you need to uh, thoroughly wash out the soapy water. In other words, you really need to work it and get every bit of that soap out of there. And then once you've, uh, your brush is finished uh, being cleaned, it needs to dry thoroughly. I mean, all the way down into the ferrule so there's no more water uh, moisture deep down in there and you know I don't know how it just depends on how warm and how dry your house is it can vary greatly but you want to make really sure that your brushes are bone dry before you go back and put them into uh, Geneva paint or any oil paint for that matter uh, water mixable paint is different it has I think uh, uh, soap you know mixed into it or detergent mixed into it which is something um, that we don't like to do with Geneva paint uh, for a number of reasons, but um, yeah, you could certainly clean your brushes with soap and water. Just make sure they're really dry and that you get every bit of the soap out. Well, that's it for today's show. If you have any questions for me for next week's episode, leave them in the comments of this video, and I will try to get to as many of those questions as I can in next week's episode. Thanks for watching.